The following program was made possible thanks to the generous support of our Kickstarter backers. Sup, Holmes? Beware! Your host, Jonathan Holmes! Arr, you beware, Sinistar, because this is a special spooky Halloween stuff, Holmes. With Natalia Figueroa. Hi, Natalia. How are you? Hello, everybody. <laughs> that was so spooky. I was terrified. The hair uh, was going to get me. I was scared. <laughs> you you uh, worked on Franbo. A game that I tell everyone about. People are asking me, what should I play for Halloween? I want to have a spooky time with friends. And I say, did you know about Franbo? And they said, why didn't you write about it, you dingus? You work for Destructoid. You haven't written about it yet. But I, my time, unfortunately, very limited when I can write for Destructoid. It's like a few hours on Sundays these days. Uh, and if I could have, I would have reviewed Franbo. Because what a delight. What a, what a perfect Halloween treat it is for the people. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Oh, my pleasure. And, <laughs> uh, maybe we can start by hearing yep. about what you did on Franbo. Kill Monday Games, your company, two yes, person kill. development team, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's me and my husband, actually. So Aww. that's it. <laughs> and then we have a bunch of cats at home and a puppet that help us to get our minds going. <laughs> that sounds like the perfect creative team. A yeah. couple who have already decided to partner in life and on all projects therein. Cats and puppets for inspiration. And yes. that's how you made Franbo? Uh, well, no, I use my computer uh, <laughs> to draw. <laughs> and I, I was, um, um, I wrote the story for it and uh, I did all the animation and the graphics and what else? That's a lot. That's <laughs> plenty. Uh, story, animation, graphics. Have you always been interested in both writing stories and illustrating them? Yeah, everything. Like um, from, I did a lot of animations be before, actually, movies and all that. Really? So it's yeah. So it's kind of a um, game. It's like putting everything together and just adding that magical uh, interaction. You know. Sure, to actually uh, be a part of how the story unfolds. Uh, yeah. Wonderful thing. So you've, uh, have you worked on like your own animated features? Have you worked on like uh, feature, uh, produced animated features as a, as a staff animator? Well, I have been a mostly anima animator. Uh, I've done like short films by my own, but nothing like very huge. Sure. And working as animator was uh, a larger experience. Oh, what uh, what did you work on? Uh, anything we might have seen? No, it's just uh, I think it's just very Swedish stuff. So. Oh, well, <laughs> the... I'm surprised! I love Swedish stuff. <laughs> yeah, but they, I don't think they they're like in other countries. I'm not okay. sure about that. Was it for television or for film or? Yeah, for uh, for television and children film uh, movies. Well, you know, now yeah. I want to look it up. So if you don't mind right. <laughs> drawing a name or two, so I can then research you later. See what yeah, you and there's a lot of um, short films mainly, actually, and some uh, music uh, videos also. <laughs> oh, wow, cool. Yeah. So when did you first uh, get work uh, professionally working as an animator? Uh, it wasn't so for maybe five, no, three years, four years ago. It wasn't oh. that much, actually. Yeah. yeah, so pretty recent. I kind of, I kind of jump uh, very quickly into like making games after being an animator. So huh. it was pretty connected. So sure. it feels like the right thing to do. And when did you start work on Franbo? Uh, it was kind of the same time. <laughs> I did everything at the same time. Um, actually, Franbo, it's a very, very old story that I wanted to do about 12 years ago. But it had evolved into movies and into puppet shows, into a lot of different things. I just wanted to get it out there. And like with games was the best thing to do. Huh. 
Uh, I, when did you yeah. first devise the idea, friend? Though, when did it first come to you? Um, well, it was like, uh, like I said, um, twelve years ago. So, um, how old were you then? Something. Well, I, I am, I'm a Chilean. I come from Chile, uh, and then I moved to Sweden when I was seventeen. Ah. Uh, and I was yes, and I was having like this huge mental issues then. Uh, and uh, when I came here, it was kind of, uh, I was kind of recovering, you know, somehow. Uh, the nature and all this switch made made me feel better in a way, but not cure cure at one hundred percent. You know, it's like a whole process, and that's that's where it started. The whole thing. I, I just wanted to portray something that told my story with this huh. mental disbalance. You know. Sure, sure, sure. So for people who don't know, Fran Bo is a story of a little girl <laughs> with a cat. And she finds herself, and, and please let me know if I'm explaining it wrong, but I think I know what Franbo is about. Uh, she is interacting with various people who she's not sure who they are and if she can trust them. And then before you know it, uh, interacting with skeletons, ghosts, uh, rooms filled with blood, all sorts of uh, sudden supernatural issues. And she's wondering, uh, what am I seeing? What is real? What is not? Could any of this be me? Or is this all uh, a real supernatural uh, world she stumbled into? That's how I interpret it anyway. Did I interpret it right? Yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, you can, you can take a lot of things from there, actually. So it can, it can uh, be connected to many different parts of your life because it's written in that way you know it's not just when i was 10 years it was until like a, a few years ago <laughs> sure sure so it's, a, it's a pretty complicated story and i feel like um <clears throat> I, uh, yeah i try to put everything together and that's the thing there's a lot to chew in a way yeah it's yeah. an incredibly ambitious project, especially for, for two people, and one that had been in the back of your head for, for a long time. I'm guessing you, yeah. uh, I don't know how old you are, but I'm guessing that 12 years it couldn't be too much less than, than half your life. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm 30 in two months. So well, it's you know, pretty much half your life you've had this. Yeah, in yeah. Your head. That's, uh, that's immense. Uh, how did it feel to commit? to telling the story through a game and to then embark on actually getting it done. Yeah, it's weird because when we started with, the, with making Frambo, we didn't really know how to do games. So the whole experience about making a game was a new, a new one. So putting everything together with a very old story that you really want to get rid of, kind of, <laughs> it was like something super strange to do at the same time i needed to learn all these new things to achieve the game and it was such a explosion in my head actually um and it kind of uh, sealed the whole process of healing in a way my mental state you know it was wow. magical really magical huh. that yeah. was incredible. so regardless of how the game does uh, financially it yeah. sounds as though it has been a worthwhile enterprise for you regardless uh, oh yes yes of course of course i mean like with isaac isaac is my husband and we always talk about that that uh, we were so afraid at not being able to uh, keep on doing games because we were afraid of not selling enough and but we always were because we thought, oh man, we, we, we are feeling so much better right now, even if we don't know what is going to happen when we finish this project. So we kind of became like super happy with the with the whole journey while making it. So it's it was amazing, actually. Ah, that's so great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's a similar experience as playing the game. You don't know what's going to happen when you're playing it. You don't know if you're going to survive because you're dealing with all these uh threatening creepy situations uh but to get to the end of it it all feels yeah. all feels worth it though still somewhat bittersweet at least that's how i felt with Franbo. it was it wasn't uh by any means like uh everything's going to be okay forever sort of end 
yeah you never know that's the thing and <laughs> then that that's what i wanted to just say that you never know what happens all the things that have been very negative in my life they came like a surprise at the same time the good things that come in life they're just happening all the time so that's why i kind of also choose this way of telling the story that it's not like right everything in your face and this is how it ends you know because it's not for me fran is not finished yet i mean she's just 11 uh, 10 years old in the game <laughs> sure, sure sure so if her story were to end in a conclusive way be like yeah. well, well you don't want a, a 10 year old story to end you want to think that she's going to keep going so that makes yeah. a lot of sense and and was it something that you were hoping to express from personal experience you already alluded that it was but specifically this idea of not being able to tell what's real and what's not what's safe and what isn't uh that's the real key feeling for me of franbo and in so many uh halloween stories that i love actually are about not being able to necessarily trust your own perception of reality, uh, let alone trust the world around you. Was that something that you you had personal experience with that you were trying to bring out? Yeah, of course, of course. It's um, mainly in the game, many of the characters, um, two of them, not many, <laughs> the two, they kind of say that, that um, you don't use your senses too much. And it's silly because it's the only way we have to communicate and to let information get inside your head, you know? So it's kind of um, trying to understand things beyond what they just tell you. And I have been having this, um, always this comparison to grown-ups and children, and uh, we are just alike, but we kind of put a lot of limitations, you know? And we want to be childish when we're old, but we don't allow that. And uh, in that way, it feels like when you're children, you let uh, your imagination be part of your life and you let uh, things that maybe they're not moving or existing or whatever, <laughs> but they become kind of part of you and that's okay. And why not? And that's when we became confused because we grow up and that's mm. kind of what I feel. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, though adults, think that having a concrete idea of what is definitely real and what definitely isn't, and therefore kind of cutting out the uh, use of imagination in everyday life, they think yeah. that's going to make things less confusing, but in fact, closing yourself off from, from any way of thinking uh, can make things more confusing, you know, leave you with less answers, yeah. I think. I mean, sometimes it feels like it can also be be an uh, ingredients for actually all of these mental disorders we have that they're like plopping up like you know more and more for every day and i don't know it's just we are so different and we want to match ourselves in a box you know and that's that's ridiculous for me and i don't think our minds are down to that and that's why i really really appreciate to be able to right now to be making games or you know expressing myself in other ways just not like being uh, you know in a in a square all the time yeah yeah, and yeah that's why i love to create stuff at the same time i love to <laughs> study how reality works you know and have that balance in me have helped me a lot to make this game and to become better with myself you know oh, that's incredible yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you always know you wanted to make video games or was it uh, Franbo, the story, Franbo, the idea, the concept that was the impetus for you to and your, and your husband to seek out game development? Actually, actually, it's very, um, we, with this, like, we, we never thought of making games. We got together because we wanted both to do movies and we wanted to express ourselves in that way. And uh, when I study animation, I, I kind of came to this other part of the, the cake, if you say so. And I realized that, oh, maybe I could like work for games because they're cool, <laughs> you know, making animations and all that. And then Isaac and I thought, 
but why can't we learn ourselves to make them instead? You know, we just watched this uh, indie game, the movie, and we were like super, super inspired by it. And also we saw other games that were made with such a little, you know, not big budgets and all that. And we were like, but yeah, we don't know anything about this, but whatever, it's life. Let's learn something new, you know? <laughs> and it was so fun to just from nowhere to, yeah. But we love games, both of us, you know, we kind of grown up with them. Our generation is, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it was, a very nice way to realize also that games did have that magical dust <laughs> in a way, their interaction that we really thought it was uh, very, very nice to incorporate in world creations. So yeah, we fell in love with it actually. So, oh, that's, that's yeah. uh, again, I'm so happy to hear all of that. Uh, what games did you play growing up? I'm trying to imagine you Little um, Italia in, in Chile. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what a Chilean video game scene was like in the 90s. Uh, no clue. What was it like? Uh, was it, it was, on PC, on, uh, on consoles? For me, it was very, very little gaming, actually. Um, I had an Atari a little while. I got borrowed by my dad, but he took it away from me. <laughs> so he wanted it for himself. <laughs> so I had to, then I play Age of Empires and kind of that, you know, on the computer. I didn't have that much money either. So I kind of play Donkey Kong and all that from other friends, you know, that had the consoles or Nintendo. But Isaac was more of a gamer though. and. Uh, he was playing everything. I have a cat here. <laughs> <laughs> you do a spooky black cat. Yeah. Perfect for the uh, Halloween spectacular. For this, is, the viewers. this is Baloo and it's my inspiration for Mr. Minley in the game. <laughs> but you yeah. have to get that now, okay? Oh, flying cat. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so whose idea was it to do a point and click uh, adventure. Had you played any point and click adventures before that, uh, or was it more your husband's idea? Where did that come from? Oh, right. So, um, actually, it was, um, you know, the things that happen in life are weird sometimes. I was just playing an online game called Alice is Dead, that I don't know if you know it. It's a free game, uh, and it's so. And I was like, oh, this is awesome, man. You just go around and looking for clues. And I didn't know about, you know, um, these great uh, point and click games from super old and classics and all that. So after that, I kind of got into it. And I was, oh my God, this is so cool to tell a story, you know? And that's how it came everything together. <laughs> oh, Alice is yeah. dead. What is that? A game where you control a character and walk around in an environment? No, or is it, it's, no? it's just a first person, person uh, point and click and it's very simple but it, it kind of affected my my imagination a lot, you know? It had very little things on the screen but oh, I wanted to do more of it, you know? I wanted to, ah, if you put something more there and there. <laughs> and it was like uh, designing an, a game and then Frambo pops up in my head and ah. Oh, that's perfect. Huh. So yeah, it was it's super like everything happened after, you know, a lot of um, things happen yeah. after each other. Sure. And yeah, so it was like that. <laughs> so uh, we've had some, uh, in my opinion, famous point and click developers on the show before the guys from pencil test who just put out Armacrog, uh, a great point and click game. They're chiefly animators, so you and they have a lot in common. Uh, prior to that, we've had Ron Gilbert on, who did uh, Monkey Island, uh, Maniac Mansion. We had Jane Jensen on, who uh, did, oh no, did I ruin my makeup? Is my chin <laughs> out of is hey. uh, Jane Jensen, who uh, did a horror suspense uh, point and click series called Gabriel Knight. And uh, mm -hmm. also, she did some Find the Object games, which are point and click, but not with a character on screen. It's more about just being in an environment and exploring it, which sounds like what Alice is Dead is like. Uh, mm -hmm. They all seem to say 
and I'm paraphrasing their their comments on point and click, but there's like a certain space in between the the player action and the uh, events on screen where the where the feeling comes from in point and click. Uh, it, it's it, watching a point and click being played is so different than playing it yourself. Watching somebody do it, it's like a, a meager puppet show where things yeah. are just kind of uh, falling into place. Whereas when you play it, you can feel such an intense uh, uh, magic, I guess, for, for lack of a better word, about this, this uh, thing on screen uh, feeling mm -hmm. like it's a, it's a real place that you're, that you're really involved with. And then for me, that's what Franbo, so much of it is about that space in between uh, concrete reality and imagination and, and getting in there and, and finding out how that feels. Um, yeah, I totally feel like that uh, when I play a point and click adventure game. It's just, oh, I don't know, you, it can be like a few pixels in the screen, but you kind of get inside that room and it, you are there. And it's weird because we are just to these games that have like so much information, you know, <laughs> and then suddenly your mind makes the the rest. That's the thing. It's like a, it's it's a construction in the head, and I think to make that exercise just in this muscle kind of <laughs> must feel like oh yeah, mm. you know, like after exercising your muscles, you feel beautiful and tight and everything. <laughs> I think it's kind of the same feeling but with the brain. Absolutely. The, what, yeah. uh, it's never been better put. We've had so many <laughs> people say that before, but the, the, to feel like your mind has been fit by having yeah. an exercise, the ability to conceive of, of abstract concepts as, as real things uh, is an amazing feeling, but it yeah. can be pretty spooky. Uh, you yeah, know, of course. I've been pretty scared playing uh, point and click games. You wouldn't think so because there's no like a, a serious action usually there's not like a a threat i don't know if you ever played the old maniac mansion the it was one of the first point and click games no i haven't i wonder if you i know. will i promise this <laughs> <laughs> well it is quite dated and even the creator of it Robert, uh told us it's like you know he still admires uh, the game for what it is, and he's actually doing a new game called Thimbleweed Park that's taking a lot from it, but he tried to learn a lot from there. Uh, but that game scared the living daylights out of me. Uh, <laughs> you get chased around by uh, a nurse, an old woman, and uh, you, unlike an action game where you can like fight her or like decide to run really fast, you're stuck with a certain lumbering speed, and she runs just as fast as you. And oh. it, it, you feel so powerless in that moment, like I would in a real life threat. I wouldn't suddenly know like how to fight and how to like run uh, in an expert dexterous way and get away. I'd probably be a, a bluttering idiot and, and stumble and, and get up, get hurt by whoever's chasing me. Frambo <laughs> gave me a similar sense of powerlessness. You're playing as a young girl um, who has abilities, but at the same time, she's quite vulnerable. Was that important to you to make sure that she felt vulnerable in that way? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, it, it feels more like we are vulnerable all the time. I mean, when you, it's weird because when when you are a child, you kind of build your brain. You're afraid of stuff like spiders or snakes or needles uh, in relationship with your experience when you were a child. So that's why different stuff scare you, and sometimes can can be like su something super super silly for somebody else and um, that's what i really wanted to put in front that she's afraid of water and she's like not so much afraid of blood and why is that you know and, and maybe she just happens to <laughs> experience blood in another way or, or strawberry juice it's not blood you know or milk like with strawberry <laughs> i don't know <laughs> It can be like so many different interpretations and I think that's the, the beautiful thing also that playing with horror and psychological horror that I love so much because it doesn't need to be like scary and oh, you know like jumping on the screen it can be something very subtle but it stays there in your under conscious subconsciousness yeah, ah, I love that <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm the, that kind of person that when I shut the the lights down, I'm I'm afraid of 
putting my foot outside the bed because I think somebody's going to grab my foot, you know? I have that feelings and I'm about become 30 years and I still have those feelings. So, <laughs> and I think we all have that vulnerability, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. scary to not know, at least the, the questions I have when I'm up late at night and it's dark and I might think I saw a ghost, but I'm not sure. I, I number one, I'm scared of a ghost because who knows what they can do. Number two, yeah. I'm wondering, like, can I even trust my own perception anymore? And that's scary. But it's also exciting because that leaves the window open for if I am not sure if what I'm seeing is real or not, then maybe there's so many more things in reality that are there that I just haven't been able to see. Maybe there's even more than I knew than I could, like you said, and like uh, Franbo sees in her game. Uh, uh, maybe just her senses aren't everything. Maybe there's something more. That's both scary and exciting. Uh, uh, what, what, what a neat game you made. I'm just talking about your game. <laughs> uh, one thing uh, that I think might have puzzled people about your game, though, people who haven't played it yet, is the fact that the art style is simple not a lot of information like you were saying before you don't overwhelm people with a, a lot of visual stimuli right off the top though it is quite detailed the characters are um iconic they're they're depicted in a way that sums up who they are pretty quickly visually uh but the the content of the game is is not simple so you have this kind of cute maybe for kids look on the surface and then before you know it there's a skeleton and there's blood everywhere and you're terrified yeah. <laughs> so uh, was that, did you ever think to yourself, um, that's a risky match between kind of a sweet surface and a, a, a supernatural, scary interior? Yeah, um, you know, about that, I think it's just to um, kind of, uh, how you say it, I don't want to harm myself, uh, protect myself. I just kind of uh, needed something very childish to work my own fears yeah so that's why i chose this kind of uh, very sweet and kind of and kind of cartoonish way of making this story because if i go to for realistic stuff it will maybe not be so easy for me to do the whole game you know and go through this all things that bother me and uh, <laughs> so i kind of choose that and in a way, I love like this aesthetics of something childish, but hiding something more deep because I felt like that my entire life. Uh, even now that I'm a grown up, it feels like my inside is so much filled with so much, so much, you know, it's not just dark stuff, it's also like happiness and all that. And it's, I don't know, the childish way felt more easy to to uh, experiment with and also to put out the, the imagery that is imagination or realities and all that. So it felt kind of na natural for me. And um, I felt that too, also that I, um, many, many older persons <laughs> have asked me this um, because they have children and they told me that their, their children thought that the game was super beautiful but then they felt bad when they saw stuff and one of the parents told me that um, the children had a bit a hard time sleeping and all that and I asked him did you have a little bit time hard sleeping and he said yes so it's not so much different between <laughs> a grown-up again and a child and and I think it's because you you uh, move something inside that um, I don't know what it is. I mean, it must be the, the fears that everybody has, you know, but it keeps you in the mind. And um, yeah, but I, I, I haven't thought too much more than, than that. You know, I, I didn't realize that it could be like an issue or bring some problem to anybody so I, I kind of did it also very childish like I don't know I just like this <laughs> I, I don't want to hurt myself and um, making this and that's it that's how it came to be like that that makes sense uh <laughs> do you think that people who are uh, awakened some of their fears are awakened by Franbo um it certainly uh, feels like a problem but I wonder 
Uh, it's, a, it's a bigger conversation that uh, I'm suddenly leaping into with you, uh, and hopefully that'll go okay. Because we're just making this up as we go along. People who are watching this at home, you know, we don't rehearse. I was talking to Natalia for maybe 30 seconds with fake fangs in my teeth before we started jumping into this. We have mm -hmm. no idea where this is going. Hopefully it's going in a good place. Uh, <laughs> but what you're saying right now is reminding me of something that uh, someone who's been on the show a couple of times, Edmund McMillan. He was actually in Indie Game, the movie. So you might remember him. He had the beard. He did the art on Super Meat Boy. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah he's a neat right. guy. Uh, uh, he is really big on this idea of not kind of coddling children and, and, and keeping them away from anything that might scare them a little bit because children are naturally drawn to things that will uh, push boundaries and they're learning for themselves how much they can tolerate in terms of fear, uh, what scares them, and in doing so, getting to know themselves and how to interact in the world around them. It's uh, similar. Uh, if you keep your house completely germ-free, then as soon as your kid leaves the house, they're going to be allergic to everything. Whereas yeah. if you allow them to interact with things that are a little bit scary, they're they're more able to navigate life when it gets actually scary, when when life is scary as opposed to a video game is scary. Uh, so I don't know if that was in the back of your head at all. Like uh, maybe we can frame it like this. If you had played Franbo when you were like, 11, 12 years old, how do you think you would have reacted to it? Yeah, I will think that it was super awesome <laughs> because really when I was a child, I was always looking at these things that you shouldn't look at, you know? It's like it's like that you say about, I don't, I don't agree either to just um, hide everything from children. I think the better idea is to bring from the darkness all this things we hide there and put it in the light, show it to them how it is, what it is, um, explain, and then, ah, okay, I'm super again. I can go and find more things in the darkness, you know? So at the end, it's all about information and how it's it's just told to the children. Because also when uh, you tell children like, oh, this will make you very, very bad, it's like, oh, that's the only information you give. You give nothing more. It's like, oh, and I think in my case, it has grown a bit of traumas there, like scaring too much without no sense, without any background information, you know? So I think it's better just to be like that. And I feel very rewarding to draw things that are dead and things that are like scary. It's like, I'm drawing you, I'm creating you, I'm not afraid of you. You, you understand what I mean? Oh, absolutely. You master it by controlling yeah. the details of it instead of it happening to you. You're the one who who's making it and proving to yourself in, in the act of that, that it's not going to defeat you. Uh, I was the exact same way when I was a kid. Uh, uh, I was terrified of zombies. I saw, like, I don't know if you've seen the old Dawn of the Dead. Uh, yes. The original one. I saw yes, maybe, like, three minutes of it. Nobody <laughs> got bitten. Nobody was eaten. There was just, like, zombies walking around, and they ran away from them. And I was yeah. like, oh, my God, there's zombies? And the people <laughs> I was watching with were like, yep, there's zombies. They could, they could be in this building right now. It was, like, a year and a half I was terrified of zombies after that. Of course, of course. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was like that with an alien movie. I was so terrified by aliens. You know, it was a kind of documentary kind of movie. And in that time, laser pointers weren't so so popular like we do with cats today. And a friend of mine did that thing and she said it was an alien and I couldn't go outside by myself in the dark, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Did you, so used there, you like get up in bed and wonder if there were aliens in the room? Yeah, of course. But when you when you kind of realize that, and I think it, that's also why I wanted to do movies. So I learn about the magic behind that, you know, because it was so much images uh, that it must it must come from somewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you kind of uh, try to make sense of what you see and what you learn with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and research. I don't know if you looked into like aliens to discover for yourself that they were really real, and if they were real, you could like tolerate yeah. it. Did you go that deep into it? 
Ah, I went all the way <laughs> to the conspiracy and all the things that, yeah, it was, um, but at the same time, it makes me, like I say, whenever I draw an alien or, you know, that kind of stuff, it makes me feel more comfortable. It's part of my culture now. I know it's a movie and all that. So, but in that time, I didn't got that information. So my imagination was like filling up my fears and all that. So I, so that's why I think it's better that you're open with your children and tell them that how it is, because otherwise you're going like, oh, like me, or you're like many years, like scared of stuff that they're not scared of, you know, like movies. Yeah, and, and yeah. games too. I was very drawn yeah. to zombie games because if I could overcome zombies in a game as a kid, I thought maybe uh, I don't need to be so scared of them in real life. The more I felt like I could control a situation where people may actually be dead and want to eat me, the better I felt about myself. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that's neat. I'm surprised that made sense to you. Uh, maybe it, maybe it didn't. Maybe you're just being nice. But either way, I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, another game that terrified me. I wonder if you played this one. I'm a little older than you, so it may be before your time. There was this game called Chiller. Probably talked about it on the show before. Uh, it's an um, arcade game where you hold a crossbow. Okay. And you go to a castle, and uh, there's, like, naked people being tortured in the game. And you can <laughs> protect them by, like, shooting the bats and crows that, like, want to peck at their legs and arms and stuff. Or you can shoot the torture devices and, like, make them spin so their heads get crushed and stuff. Like, you can shoot them in the leg, and they're just like, ah, that hurt. Ah. So, I haven't played that one. What was the name again so I can check it out? Oh, sure. It's called Chiller. Chiller, like, okay. Chiller. Yeah. Uh, Thriller yeah. was a very popular music video by Michael Jackson at the time. And they were just like, sounds like Thriller. Let's call it Chiller. Uh, and what really scared me about Chiller was the fact that this arcade game was just an arcade for kids. Like there was Pac-Man, mm -hmm. there was uh, Galaxian, and then just this like game about shooting naked people in the face. And they were like, <laughs> this is fine for kids. It, it, it didn't, I didn't realize it at the time, but I felt like, what kind of place am I in? Am I in a safe place if this yeah. kind of thing is gonna be played? Who is playing this game? And are they gonna do something dangerous to me? Because I was just like eight years old, maybe, well, maybe I was 12. But uh, I was a well, young 12. I was an immature young lad. Still thinking <laughs> about video games all the time. So uh, I'm wondering, when it comes to you and the parents who have given you feedback about Franbo, whether what they're really scared of is, can games like this end up getting to my kids? And that alone is scary to them. Like, uh, do we live in a world now where kids have access to just about everything? And yes. they do. They actually do, if you have the yeah. internet. Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel kind of it will be very, very bad if something bad happens, of course, with Fran or something like that. But I think that's also why I really love the positive side of the game, because it, it not only brings the dark side, it also brings a lot of hope and a lot of love. And I think that's why I'm not so afraid of these triggers or kind of that because everything it's everything is covered by this love you have um Fran for the kitty and kind of keeping uh, being alive you know like trying to understand what's happening and at the end you kind of meet these beautiful characters that care about you and you realize that oh maybe life is bigger than my own fears there's so much left to see around you know so I, I think I think that is why also I needed to do a positive part in the game too just to feel better with myself also you know that there is hope with this <laughs> feeling like this you know yeah it's a it's a wonderful thing and it's only honest if you mm -hmm. acknowledge that sometimes things feel hopeless. If you send the message that, oh, everything is great all the time, uh, kind of a, a My Little Pony uh, wonderful world of, of uh, sometimes someone being a little bit mean, uh, that doesn't convey the message to people in a way that they believe as much as showing them darkness and then telling them, but in fact, you have reason to have hope. 
Uh, yeah. yeah. And you know, also a thing that I think is, I mean, it's how I see it, but many times um, I felt while I, I was growing up that I got more attention when I was feeling bad. Mm. And uh, I kind of didn't got love when I was feeling happy or positive. So I kind of also used my darker side to get attention, you know, and kind of making terrible things uh, just for that. And when you realize you kind of don't want to, you don't want to see that. That's not true. I, I have these problems in my head. I just want them to be like that. I mean, it's, it, it goes like in periods, you know? And uh, when I came to that period, I was just doing a lot of things just to get attention. And uh, it's not, uh, when you realize that you're doing that and you realize that you're not loving not, nothing at all, it's kind of, you, you lose all meaning. So mm. there must be a balance between the love and kind of insecurities are okay because we are, kind of learning all the time so it's normal but also having in mind that we more understand the less will hurt or the less will make us afraid you know yeah yeah and yeah. and you um very humbly undercut uh, uh the motivations you had for for showing um you know for showing negative feelings for for letting out some things that might have, um, you know, been less positive uh, as looking for attention, but there must have been a reason you were looking for attention. And I have yeah, to guess that reason was because you felt genuinely unsettled at, at times. And that was a truth you wanted people to know, but you also could use showing that unsettledness uh, in a way to wield power over your situation. And there must have been reasons why you wanted to, to have more power over your media environment as well. Um, oh, yeah. Again, probably because of anxiety. Um, is that the the main like if there were because uh, you said before it's it's about mental health in some ways, Franway, Franbo, in a lot of ways. Are there like key ideas about mental health, uh, key experiences with mental health issues that you're hoping to come across, like anxiety or depression, that sort of thing? <clears throat> yeah, um, I mean, it feels like. Um... When, when I was like younger, just had this, uh, it's okay if I talk like openly, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you'd like to, yeah, nothing. Nobody is will get scared or anything. <laughs> yeah, but um, there, there are like moments in my life that I really plan, even plan to be ill or, you know, because we as people, require love it's something natural in us from the moment we born and when you're not giving that uh, in, and you kind of get confused and kind of realize that if you have anxiety or you are depressed people will start asking also so it's kind of yeah it's kind of a, a circle you know we are circle and when you realize where the issues come from you kind of want to confront yourself and try to understand what what can i do to to become better so sure so yeah. uh just so i'm clear uh you said you would plan to become ill when you were younger was that a way to kind of express that you didn't feel well emotionally because that yeah, that right. happens a lot with kids they'll feel incredibly anxious but if you just say i feel bad your parents may say, oh, well, you know, um, you know, don't cry. It'll be okay. Don't yeah. worry about it. As opposed to if they say, I feel sick, my stomach hurts. Then they say, oh, we have to do something about this. We need to yeah. apply attention and apply support. Um, so was that the kind of thing that you meant? Yeah, both, actually. <laughs> it's like a, a kind of, um, well, I, I went through a very, very, um, traumatic event when I was about seven, um, 15 years old. And then I, I was uh, an unwanted child from the beginning. So all that, all that thing was like in me and, you know, small things that happen away the, the pad that just adds to the negative. <laughs> so you kind of, um, 
I was very sick very much when I was little, like real sickness, uh, I couldn't breathe and all that. So I understood there that I got attention. And in getting older, so I kind of understood that, evolved it, and kind of used it mentally also and feeling terrible all the time. So it's kind of a process. And that's why I'm so happy that I got to do Frambo because for me, it's, it was my medicine, you know, like the last medicine for <laughs> this head to wow. be a bit more balanced. So uh, it, feels, it feels awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, something that so many people are looking for. They have had um events happen to them that, that change your biochemistry you suffer from trauma and you no longer experience the world in the same way anymore you, your your brain the chemicals in your brain don't fire the way they used to yes uh, you know there, there's there's studies to show it um so the idea of being able to get that out whatever kind of toxicity and poison has come into you that makes it so things don't taste the same or look the same or feel the same anymore. To actually get it out is so many people's dream. They'll spend 30 years in therapy just hoping that one of these days they can get it out in the right way and they'll feel stuck with it. And, and you, uh, maybe you uh, could start advertising this as a new form of mental health treatment. Make a video game. It only yeah. takes two years. Get married to a talented person who uh, will help with the, uh, the coding. Was he more of the programming side? No, he didn't know anything. He was from zero. So everything was marry like... an untalented person. Just find <laughs> anyone. You don't have to marry them. You just team up with somebody, create a thing that exactly. helps exercise some of your demons, and it and it seems to work. Yeah, you know, I think it's. I, I mean, it's like you have to be so own uh, honest honest yes honest all the time with yourself while creating something that you cannot like lie to you more it's like mm -hmm. when when you are having it's like all illnesses have a solution almost all of them some of them are legal so of course but many of them have a solution and so many times we just my father told me that he has kidney issues and he eats only garbage all the time and he's very very upset and all that and that there you realize he hasn't been responsible with his eating, so he's ill now. And I was doing the same. I was kind of eating a lot of sugars and a lot of fats because I was feeling so sad all the time. I, I need to eat, I need to eat. I was changing love for food. I was, <gasps> yeah. And when I realized that, okay, my hormones are, we are now, are, they, they, my mind is not working, so I kind of, realize that I need to do something else. I need to change my way of living and also having this constant thing, making the game was, the story goes like this. You cannot lie to yourself if you really want to put everything in the right order. You have to understand the story, right? So it was a whole process, you know? It's just, yeah, it's it changed my entire lifestyle. That's the thing. It's it's like if you have something, don't be in the same place because nothing will change. Mm. Everything will remain the same. So it has to be a whole thing that change, I guess. Yeah. To, Honesty yeah. with yourself, uh, such a challenge for, for most of us. There's so many ways that we lie to ourselves in order to gain short-term comfort, but it causes long-term problems. And anger can really do that. Some of the people... Some of the angriest people I know are very, very uh, uh, emotionally dishonest with themselves anyway. They'll tell themselves, oh, what I'm doing is right <laughs> by either hurting themselves or somebody else or staying in an unhealthy relationship like forever. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's the anger driving them because they need to feel like they can cause some damage to something all the time. That's uh, anger drives that. Yeah, you know, I was talking to Isaac about this uh, before uh, the interview now, and I just told him that, you know, Isaac, actually, it's you that taught me to love because before I didn't know what love really meant because it was always around sickness or around, uh, you know, eating a lot or, you know, worrying about things that, of course, um, family wants to give you the food, a, a roof, uh, because are the vital things to keep living but it's not just that and that's the issue when yeah <laughs> so i kind of understood what love really meant in these years we have we have been together and that also helped 
to realize what was left to myself also and to other people and all that. So it can be also that many people don't really understand what love is. M maybe for many, love means hit another person, harm them and yell at them and be mean to them because that's the way they got love. So th that's that's the magical and I'm so thankful for that, for that being able to learn them from making a game was like illuminated, you know? <laughs> Like my screen went all white and I was, ah! <laughs> <laughs> ah uh, yes, I, again, I sound like a broken record, but that just couldn't be too much better. And did, did you and Isaac, did you get married and then work on Franbo? Or did you start working on Franbo and then get married? <laughs> nah, we were married from before. Actually, we got married after like um, two months after we met each other. So it was everything pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> oh, how long ago was that? Uh, we have been together six years now and three years of making Rambo, three, two years and a half, three years. Wow, that's, that's, that's incredible. So after two months, you knew that it was right and that marriage was the way to go? Yeah, but we, we also think that's because nobody wanted <laughs> And we also did it, you know, like this very, very teenage riot. We are teenagers. We do what we want. <laughs> now, nah, but we felt that it was, we were like very, very, he's so totally different to me. We are like black and white, really, really. Like huh. so different that we get along super well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you compliment each other. Yeah, a compliment. That's the thing. <laughs> sure. And uh, yeah. I find that differences, uh, like in Franbo, how there's bright and sweet, and then all of a sudden dark and threatening, uh, yeah. you know, the supernatural versus uh, cartoonishly happy. Uh, that contrast keeps things interesting. It, it, it almost generates a fire, like the friction between the two forms. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you and Isaac were like exactly alike, or if all of Franbo was nothing but blood and skeletons, you wouldn't get much energy from it after a while. It would be kind of a, a one note tune, but having yeah. contrast uh, brings energy out. Yeah, of course, of course. And that helps, I think, to get uh, the beauty of everything because darkness is not always that bad, you know, when you get to know it. And light is not always that good if there's no darkness. So it's kind of, it has to be both of them all the time. And it's okay. That's the thing. It's okay to be sometimes a bit, <laughs> but I don't like this. And then, hey, I like this other thing or, you know, like, well, or maybe I'm too. <laughs> no, you're absolutely <laughs> too right. Double personality. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's a, it's a dynamic, uh, yeah, fascinating dynamic. personality, which is, which is much better. I wonder, because uh, uh, you, you make a strong point. Uh, whoa, is it, who's that bird? I miss the red. <laughs> That's Mr. Red. That's my friend Puppet. I told him he could pop up sometime if he wanted to. <laughs> Where, how long have you known Mr. Red for? Uh, when we did the Indiegogo campaign to make the money for Frambo, um, I was like playing around with this puppet we have at home. And um, he is so positive, you know, like so positive. And I love that about Mr. Red. So he wanted to help us with the campaigns and the videos and all that to make it a bit, uh, uh, to have fun with it, you know? <laughs> so he was uh, born there. He huh? did even uh, um, a music video and all the thing that <laughs> he I missed some... that for the for the Indiegogo campaign. Yeah, yeah. Now, Indiegogo so was, is a lot riskier than Kickstarter for, for a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. Uh, um, still successful. Yes, it was successful. And uh, actually, we wanted to do a Kickstarter to the beginning because it was what was in, you know. <laughs> but then we realized that in Sweden, they didn't have it. So, you, I mean, you, you could do it if you had somebody else, like in the States or something like that. So we kind of, okay, we do it with the Indiegogo. And we, we before Frambo, we did um, another Indiegogo for another short film. But there we got like zero nada. 
no mm. money Oof. it was like nothing at all so we were a bit like oh okay let's do this again and let's try for the best so and things got better when we released the alpha demo so and people was like oh this is cool and i like it and and we were like ah, okay <laughs> <laughs> you know, super happy about the, the attention that the game was getting and it also helped us a lot to to like not lose the, the energy to make it. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, how much money did you need? How much did you get from the Indiegogo campaign? Um, because we didn't know much about making games then, so we asked for $20,000 and uh, we raised $28,000. So it was more what, a lot more than we expected. So it was very, very awesome. <laughs> but uh, actually, we when when it comes after after two years of uh, Indigo, because we were making Frambo in the like a side uh, side project while working. Uh, but when we got Indiegogo, we kind of start working like one hundred percent on the game, and then we realized that the money was not enough mm. um so we kind of isaac's uh, grandfather died and he left him a little money so he saved us actually to make the game complete so um, it's kind of sad to say but oh my god <laughs> it's uh it's the double thing again you know something happy comes from something super sad and mm -hmm. So that's how we we did the game actually. Otherwise, we we should have been more like cut down a lot of material and a lot of ink content of the game. Sure. Did the yeah. game uh, end up having as much content as you had hoped, or was there anything you still couldn't quite fit in? <sighs> there there was a few things that didn't make it. Um, I really wish in a few years, if it's possible, to make like the. Um, the uncut version <laughs> to add this these details but um ah, i mean we did the best we could and um, we were running out of money like crazy you know what we released one uh, on august because we didn't have money to next month to pay wow. rent so that that tide was the release you know so we were like, it has to sell something. It has to <laughs> somehow, and it did. So it's okay. <laughs> we are at home. We didn't need to go to our mummies again. So. Well, that that brings me uh, to where I was heading next, which is how was the response to Franbo been, and how has it been for you to receive that response? <clears throat> oh, uh, we have fan arts. Did you know that? You have what? Fan arts. Fan arts. Fan arts? I'm not surprised. I haven't seen it myself yet, but I look forward to looking it up. So, so amazing with uh, people cosplaying Frambo and all that. And it feels like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> super awesome. And then the response in the game is like super sweet. I never expected so much understanding that's the thing the people are understanding the game and oh i have seen these videos on youtube like um, a psychopath you know <gasps> more videos <laughs> yeah. um, and it's so sweet to see the reactions you know because it's it's not somebody from your family that tells you oh you did good you did good it's somebody that doesn't know anything about you you know and that's the most precious thing and uh, also, we also got a little bit of a uh, negative uh, reviews, uh, and I really appreciate that because it's our first game, so it really gives the, a glimpse of what we can do better next time. So I'm very happy about that. But the positive part is like, oh, I, I still cannot believe it. It's incredible. Oh, yeah, geez. and you know, also this a lot of emails and saying thank you. That's that's like. Uh, I don't know how to express how thankful I am for that. It's super awesome. Oh, and I'm yes. sure they're thankful that you're thankful that they're thankful. Sure that <laughs> and we thankful to everybody, <laughs> which is like what love often is. When you find 
uh, I wanted to get your definition of love before we go on too farther. But I, I, for me, that is one definition of it. When you put out something that's honest and you're afraid that people aren't going to understand it and you're making yourself vulnerable in that way, and they have no reason to say anything nice about it other than they too are being honest. And they are making themselves vulnerable by reaching out to someone who created this thing and say, I loved it and here's why I loved it. Uh, mm -hmm. That understanding, that vulnerability and that realness and that honesty and that mutual appreciation is one way of looking at what, what love might be. Uh, yeah, is that how you see it too? That's, that's very nice how you put it. Uh, actually, it feels, it feels so open, you know, like, yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah, we thank you. <laughs> and it's super nice. I love it. And I love to be able to answer everybody if we can, you know, it's, it's super amazing. And also other, other people have come to us and ask, how, how can I do a video game, you know? And that's so cool. That's uh, super cool. The whole yeah. thing. <laughs> I imagine you are the role model and you and Isaac are the role models for a lot of people who would uh, love to do what you did, but they don't necessarily have what you had that brought you to actually follow through with making it. Uh, as someone who's uh, done plenty of projects in the past, I'm sure you know how hard it is and how demoralizing it is when you want to start a project and then you suddenly can't finish it. Something happens and yeah. you, you can't complete it. Video games, uh, from where I stand, that happens more often than not. Almost everyone I know who wants to make video games has not been able to complete something, but you did. How did you manage to do it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were zombies, so we. <laughs> yeah, now it's like super. I I think it's because we just uh, kind of were tired of failing so much before. Also, I mean, like I told you, the story of Rambo is it was like thought wrote read. Uh, it was wrote wrote it. I wrote it uh, like twelve years ago, and. Uh, and then we did movies that didn't go nowhere and you know like a lot of failures and also all the personal stuff and all that mixed together it was like okay let's do this and when you have like the money for do for doing it the indiegogo was like a huge kick to us it's like okay we have this amount of money and this amount of time so we have to attached to that and that's the only thing that matters so that was the only thing that really mattered we did not have social life or we did not have like a relationship we were just like in front of our computers all the time and uh and it's funny because i didn't miss much of the things that we kind of lose you know because it was so rewarding to do the game itself that um now i feel like I want to do another game. <laughs> That's the only thing. You know, I could like take a vacation or something, but it's like, okay, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, I'm certain you will do another game and I'm confident it's going to be worth playing, but uh, I can't help but wonder, uh, this happens to me a lot, by the way, I don't want you to feel like I'm singling you out, but I'll stumble upon a game that looks really good. And I'll be like, oh, everyone's going to be talking about this game, Franbo. Like, uh, we're in an era where Tim Burton is no longer making stuff that Tim Burton fans traditionally liked. There's this big, like, opening. People, like, point and click again. Uh, uh, Double Fine Adventures comes out as well. Here's another game that looks a uh, similar style as uh, uh, point and click adventure. It's called, uh, what did it end up being called? Broken Age, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the time is perfect for Franbo, I'm thinking. And it did well. But it isn't like um, constantly being talked about everywhere on the internet, like how Undertale or Downwell or these other games that kind of caught fire with uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, like, what, what I want to make sure that Franbo becomes a huge hit, like even bigger hit than it is, and that the next game is too. Is there anything that can be done to make sure that more people are like talking about it, and know about it? I don't know. That's the thing. <laughs> it's so, it's so it's so difficult because um, I don't know how it really works. I mean, when we when we uh, did have the game just in the making, you know, all the t uh, all the magazines wrote about it. I mean, in the Indiegogo also, and it was a little bit, you know, not like 
uh, the Indiegogo, and that's it. And and then when the game is out, it's like uh, nobody's writing about it, and it's weird. It feels like why? I, I just want to know why. That will be a very awesome thing to know. <laughs> you know, I can tell because you I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know. You know I don't a know whole what lot. happened. <laughs> I, I, I uh, have to disagree with you. You know a whole bunch of stuff. But I can tell you from the, 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 the side that we're on these days with the video game blogs and whatnot, um, there's a lot more risk. If you write about a game that people don't already care about, uh, no one's going to read it anyway. It's happening more and more. I've seen over the past couple of years. Video game blogs, people tend to go to them, or video game websites, whatever you want to call them. They go to learn about a new game, or they go to read more about a game they already care about. Yeah. And it's, it's, it used to be like 50-50 or maybe 60-40. Now it's like 90. All the stories that are popular on Structoid, or most of them, are about things people already care about like PewDiePie or Metal Gear Solid or censorship in Fatal Frame 5 or something because people have such an invested relationship with Nintendo. The, the, the amount people are clicking on stories about something they've never heard of, they don't go to uh, video game blogs for it in the same way they used to. They go to Reddit, they go to uh, the, the NeoGAF, they go to these places that are thought to be kind of the, the vestige of just uh, video game fans talking about video games, kind of the ground level grassroots place. And if you're a game like Cat Lateral Damage, I don't know if you've heard of that one. Uh, it's a game uh, about yeah. a cat that knocks things over. It's very cute. Whoa, if you like it, maybe you can do a crossover. I'm sure you'd love that. <laughs> Cat Lateral Damage guy, he's a wonderful guy. His name's Chris Chung. I can introduce you later. Uh, but he just like put his game out and then Reddit talked about it and then ABC, a major, uh, American television uh, website and, and news station talked about it, and then everyone knew about his game. No, mm -hmm. no blogs heard about it. Uh, and if blogs had written about it, people might have just thought, eh, I haven't heard of that game, so I don't care about that game. It's yeah. not the grassroots level you find on Reddit and NeoGAF where, uh, where people really uh, go to learn about new things. That's what I've noticed anyway. I could be totally wrong, but hopefully that gives you some, some idea of it. It's not because Frenbo isn't super interesting and exciting, it's because a lot of game blogs probably looked at it and thought, people don't come to us to read about new things anymore. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. yeah. It, it can be so many things, actually. Um, <laughs> we we kind of realize now that uh, Frambo is very much of a mouth to ear, or how you say that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so like people yeah. talk about it, and, and that's how we get it out, in a way. But... Um, I have to say, I'm a very, very weird person when it comes to social media also. I'm super, super like, okay, what should I say? You know, <laughs> I don't know what to say because really? it's, huh. yeah, it's like, it's like so much I can say, but at the same time, I need, I, I know I need to be like quickly and all that. Uh, sure. Um, or sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And we have actually more people writing to us asking review keys and all that about sites that I never heard about. And it, that's awesome. I mean, I really, yeah, of course. In, in that way, we have uh, people caring a lot in that way, you know, but uh, maybe it's not like super, and it's also a lot of YouTubers that have played the game. So in that way, they, they kind of help a lot to spread the word also. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. uh, speaking of that, it's YouTube is another grassroots place along with Reddit and NeoGAF, where games like Five Nights at Freddy's, I don't know if you've played that, mm -hmm. no blog wrote about that. The, the yeah. Otaku, Destructoid, nobody cared until it had already made like $10 million or something. Because yeah. that grassroots uh, uh, word of mouth or mouth to ear, as you put it, uh, that's how uh, people discover new things these days. And it's yeah. uh, the same token. Publishers like Devolver Digital, they love games like yours. I wonder, have you talked with them? Maybe that no. would be a thing. Well, I, you know, I, if you know. want the Flambo director's cut to happen, that's the <laughs> way to go because they're, they're very nice uh, people. I'm sure you'd get along with them. Maybe I can introduce. We have a couple of questions that came in. How All much right. time do we have left on the show? 20 minutes or so. So we've oh, got plenty okay. of time for questions. Uh, Darla Goddess Hate asks, I'm curious as to whether there will be DLC 
and whether we will learn more about Fran's family. Sounds like uh, one of your fans in the audience <laughs> there. Uh, <Yay>. we're <laughs> DLC, <laughs> I imagine uh, pros and cons to that. Have you considered it already? Uh, not really. I mean, you know, we are just two people and we still need to get the game out on the mobile devices. So mm -hmm. we're working on that right now. And uh, things go a lot slower when you're just two. Um, but uh, we're also learning. So that's why we want to learn this stuff. Um, but about, uh, I just want to do like um, in the future, if we can just to do something like I said, the director's cut with uh -huh. new content. <laughs> would there will be, be more about Fran's family in the director's cut if you were to do it? Um, or would you want to keep that more um, uh, to the player's imagination? Uh, all right. If I'm totally honest, I would love to do many games about Frambo World <laughs> and explain everything, all the little parts of... Oh. You know these five realities they have so much to i have so much to tell about those so <laughs> huh. so it, yeah. not just a director's cut but if you could sounds like you would show as much of that world as you possibly uh could put out uh, yeah i mean i have so much material i need to put it somewhere <laughs> can you tell us a little more about the five realities for people uh we talked so much but I do feel a little badly that we didn't explain more. I did like my cursory explanation, but if you can tell us a little bit more <laughs> about the world of Franbo for people who haven't played it, specifically yeah. about the five realities. I mean, I really don't want to put everything out because that will blow everything, you know, like, eh, uh, what? Give us some, for people who haven't played it, what can they uh, expect to feel with these five realities? Can you give us any hints? Well, um, See, that's the bad part of me. I don't know what to say when you ask me those kind of things. <laughs> because <laughs> I will really tell odd. everything. All right. Yeah. Uh, so it feels a bit like um, these five realities are connected to our five... Um, <clears throat> um, if you say so, kind of... If you put like... Um, uh, uh, how you call it? Oh, my, my English sucks. That's okay. You're doing great. <laughs> Your, your, All right, your it's like a, it's like a temperature meter. Thermometer. Uh -huh. Thermometer, yeah. <laughs> All right, so that and you kind of divide it in five, uh, and you go from um, light to dark, right? And in those, the reality changes, and uh, you come to life and dead and all that in between. So that's may mainly the five realities is like the five states of material and mm -hmm. um, you know and energy and all that it's very very like uh, the cycle of the the water you know that becomes ice or clouds and then it rains it's the same thing but in different yeah yeah so you yeah. kind of get it in your mind or in reality in because of your senses in in a way or the other. <laughs> and it, it was a brave choice, in my opinion, to go with five because it's challenging to, to people to have to learn that much uh, and also to have to do away with the conventional thinking, which is like live or dead. You know, there's the, the or heaven, hell and earth. There's two or three usually. But five speaks to the idea that there's more, even more than you uh, ever thought there was and that you have mm -hmm. to open your mind to discover what that is. You can't just go with your preconceived notions, which is why I thought it was so neat that you went with five. Great job. Yeah. I mean, in, that's why also I want to bring that up of the, that is five and not just like um, uh, hate and love, you know, mm -hmm. it's sure. more than that. Yeah. Things are it's fairly like, that simple in, in life. And uh, though uh, Franbo is simple uh, on the surface in some ways, because again, the characters are very clean and very easy to understand at least what they they represent visually there's much more to them than that what fun yeah one you you made for us art our link sorry our link fender asks did you ever want to give up at some point on making franbo was there ever a point where you thought you had to stop um yeah definitely when um when things get too complicated and when things get like 
they're not going anywhere you know like you're making so much work in so many hours and you don't know if it's night or day or did you eat did you go to the toilet you know all those simple things just disappear and when you get in that mental state it's like all right i need to stop doing this so yeah there, there was several times but maybe not to the point that to say okay i quit no uh, it was always if there was something very terrible, then it will come the love again. It was days that I don't want to see that game. Please take it away from me. You know, <laughs> that, but no more, no more hate than that. <laughs> uh -huh. And I imagine that you would have to have those days and overcome those days yeah. in order to see in yourself that you're really capable of persevering for this project, that uh, you learn how much something means to you if it gets so hard that you give up but then you still come back to it yeah definitely and it's like the the what friend goes through also it's like something negative that you has to get up and keep going you know it's like it's the same process but maybe in different levels you know um we are all different we perceive everything like more or less so. yeah absolutely uh another question from Kalismi, sorry if I said that wrong, asks, how did you find the experience of writing for an interactive medium opposed to writing for animation or film? Oh, that was one. Oh, all right. <laughs> it's so different. I mean, you you kind of just write, uh, when you write a story, you kind of go to A to B, right? And, but to, in, in, in games it's like it, you have so many ways to go and in a point and click adventure you can talk to a character several times and you know it's like everything is kind of disconnected but in the same time you have to make a sense of it so it's kind of um yeah it's pretty tricky but it's fun it's like making a puzzle you know mm. like putting everything together yes this is okay and all that you know it's fun but tricky. Did you find yeah. that uh, with a game, you didn't have to write as much as if you were writing for, for animation or film because so much of the, the story can come across and just how things interact? Or did that not make a difference? Um, I mean, for a film, actually, you kind of add a lot of details and, uh, uh, you know, like, in clips to um, tell something. But in a game, you kind of living up that feeling all the time because it's you that you're putting attention to this little part and you're learning more of it. So you don't need to, it's kind of more free in a way. And uh, it gives a lot of different, um, it gives a more three-dimensional um, aspect to something. And I find that very, very interesting. Um, but I don't know if it's less uh, words or, you know, <laughs> sure, sure. I ended up writing like 45,000 words in Framble, so there's a lot. <laughs> Whoa, I um, didn't realize there was that, that yeah. much, and that's all in-game text, or was that, like, did you write Frambo originally as a story uh, and then um, kind of take some of that narrative text and then have it just occur as the, the environment, or, or did all of that text actually go into the game, all, all 45,000 words? Um, yeah, I mean, in dialogue is that 45,000 words. <laughs> That's Whoa. the, yeah, because the game itself, I mean, the game itself evolves with dialogue the mostly. It's very little that is in the cutscenes, and it's also dialogue. So it's kind of um, when you write the story, I, I, I used to just write the whole scene or this whole idea and what characters are going to say what. And, you know, a little bit like um, a quick sketch uh, of uh, a, the story. And then when everything is together, then you put it, put all the, the things that may be a bit weird and fix that and that and go back and forth. But when you write like a normal story, it's more like from beginning to end. And sure. then you go and pick up some stuff maybe to change, but it's not so dynamic dynamic like uh, with games. It feels more like uh, a living thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. As you piece it together, it comes to life. And then yeah. you can see what you do or do not need to add to make that life fuller. But then it changes again every time you add or subtract something. So yeah. this is why it takes two years to make a, a video game for a lot of people. And you did it. You totally so happy you did it. Not, not yeah. easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel too. Uh, <laughs> are there any uh, game series that you would enjoy working on something uh, I, I don't imagine that there definitely is because so much of what you're capable of doing is having an idea come to you that is kind of your own reality filtered through your subconscious and your imagination and have like a real relationship with it earlier today i met a puppet i think his name was mr red yes yeah <laughs> you want like to see him again i'd love to see mr red again hello <laughs> You, I'm Mr. Red, the fact that you know. I do know, Mr. Red, because so <laughs> this is your power. You are able to. Mm. I, I'm not saying Mr. Red is one of your creations, because I don't know. I'm not going to presume anything. But he I, might. I'm not be... a real boy, but I'm not. <laughs> but I want to be a real boy sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be more adorable and a little scary. This is such a fun conversation. I don't like uh, Rainbow. Uh, you're able to create these things and have real relationships with them, even though they came from you. This is a, a, a thing that not everybody can do. So that makes me wonder, would you even want to work on some other property, you know, like a new Donkey Kong game or a new Monkey Island game? Uh, are there um, any, or, or maybe not even a video game property, like a, a Tim Burton property uh, or... Uh, a movie or animated thing to, to translate it to video games. Do you have any or you should do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do my own thing, you know? <laughs> I'm happy to hear it, and I'm not entirely surprised to hear it. So that brings me to what might be next. You have to do Franbo for mobile. You have uh, technical things to have to, to work out, and you want to continue to market Franbo and, and let people yeah. know that it's out there. But if you were to work on a new game, do you have any uh ideas about what direction you'd want to go into yes i have two ideas already that i want to do but um they're just like you know sketches and all that and i'm just saying to isaac oh isaac you know i thought about this in the shower what did you think <laughs> yeah, it's more like that nothing nothing serious yet because i really want to get uh, over kind of with fran and the uh, mobile versions and all that because making games is so much fun in comparison with the part when you have to share it and sell the game. Uh -huh. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's, it's nice. It's nice, the, the interaction you have with the fans and the people that really care about what you're doing. That's so awesome. And I've learned about so many other people and how they work and their art and everything. And it's cool. But that part when the money comes in, it's like, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Are there any grants? Like I hear more and more about, especially in European countries, you can get a grant for $50,000 or something just to make a video game about, oh, I don't know, the, 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 treating homeless people better or something along those lines. The government sometimes will give money for those things. Yes, that sounds yes. like it would be perfect for you because you don't really care about getting rich. You don't no. me as... It's not my thing. I, I just want to be able to sit here, you know, and know that I have food and my, you know, where to live and be calm, calm to be able to create something. That's it. And I eat my veggies and all that. <laughs> Well, yeah. that, can, that can happen. Do you do you feel like you've learned lessons from the creation of Franbo, uh, like anything specific that you would then apply to making the next game? Like, are you sure that the next game will be point and click? Or have you ever thought to yourself, I wish I could do some uh, other form of, of, of game that would be able to give me what I wanted that I couldn't get from point and click? Any Any of those thoughts? Yeah, I re I, right now um, I also intend to learn some 3D because I, I can't do 3D. Uh, so that's some of something that I really want because I don't want to do just point and click all my life. You know, it feels like games have so much to do and uh, 
I want to do everything I can before I become too old and I cannot move my hands, you know? You know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're embarking on uh, an era where we finally have video game developers who are like in their 50s, who have been doing it since the 70s or 80s. Uh, John and Brenda Romero uh, immediately come to mind. They, John, and I think Brenda might have worked on Doom in some capacity as well. They're making a new game called um, something Taco Truck. They like made a game for their son about a taco truck that it shoots things. I okay, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm off on a tangent. But my point is, you could be this uh, part of this next generation. You could be 80 years old still making video games. Uh, yeah. a new generation of people who do it their whole lives. There's really no reason you'd ever have to stop. I won't stop. I mean, really, it's so awesome. It has to happen something terrible or, you know, like dead. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. yeah. But I love it. It's, it's just where I can put everything I love to do, like from music, drawing, animation, acting, and all that. Just like, ah, yeah, <laughs> my brain feels like, oh, yes, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so acting, you, you seem yeah. like you would be a natural uh, voice actress as well. Um, I've been in, into acting more, way more than anything. I, I started when I was four years old. So really? I, yeah, so I've been like trying to do everything for uh, being actress too. And it came along pretty well, but then I realized that I don't want to do commercials and all that kind of stuff that really gives the money uh -huh. because I'm an anti-social person. <laughs> so I, I'm an anti-commercial, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you certainly don't seem like anti-social for, for my definition of the term means one of two things. It means like I don't want to be social or like yeah. I actually kind of hate people. You don't seem to be either of those things. No, um, I don't hate people. I really like people <laughs> when they're nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> but you do seem as though you couldn't stomach for very long anything that was ingenuine. Like, uh, it's funny you would say that honesty with yourself and with uh, the person you're with and with your creative process is so important to you because that's like exactly what Edmund McMillan said to us when he was on the show a few months ago. Uh, so many successful creators, that's really what they live by. So they don't end up acting in commercials anymore. They end up doing voice acting for like, could Mr. Red get a game? And could yes. you do voice acting for that? Because that would be pretty good. There is actually a game uh, with Mr. Red. How do they do this? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's in our uh, Kill Monday website. Um, we did it for Christmas, and it's a very bloody Christmas story. And it's a it's a platformer, and it's so hard you die. It's like it's it's very hard to beat the game. And I can't wait to play it. <laughs> and he's like playing around and jumping and making tap and jump and all that stuff. Yes. He was pretty awesome in that, <laughs> but it's all like 2D animation, you know, and it's pretty sweet. <laughs> I can't wait to play it. Are there any other games that uh, normally I get into people's whole gameography? I wrongfully assumed that Franbo was like your your only real project, but there's is there any more <laughs> other than that and Mr. Red's bloody platformer adventure? We did also, I wanted to do like um, a pornographic game also. And that was like the first one. And it was all super huge pixels. So it was that was the, the funny part that it was already censored. Eh? Ah. Eh? <laughs> you get it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just about pushing the, um, the space and, you know, <clears throat> making sexual um, movements in the screen. It can yeah. this game? Did this game come to I be? It it should be in our website, but I don't know what happened that the link doesn't work anymore. So we have to check it out because we haven't been able to like do anything else that Frambo in these two years. Sure. So we kind of left all those tiny games aside. But it got pretty good on um, on Reddit when that <laughs> pornographic game was out. <laughs> I'm not and also we did also some Ludum Dare games too. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. uh, after uh, Franbo is out on mobile and all that work is done, I hope 
those can return to us uh, and that they're all up on the Kill Monday website. What's the name of the pornographic game? Just so I can look it up later. It's Pixel with three X. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I can't wait. Hopefully I can find a mirror version of it or something. Uh, and did I say your name right? Natalia? Natalia, yes. Oh, good. I said it right. Yeah, I never know. Uh, until it's too late, usually. Natalia, thank you so much for being on the thank show. I, I couldn't have had much more fun than I had. And I'm sorry I looked uh, so ridiculous while we were talking about so many. <laughs> You're quite uh, pale, yes. Yeah, I know. I <laughs> you, uh, the people can find you on Twitter. You're on there, aren't you? Yes, uh, uh, at um, Urania Orwell. It's a pretty silly name, I don't know. So it's better you find uh, Frambo Game. That's easier. Mm -hmm. At right. Frambo Game and or Kill Monday. Kill Monday Games, yes. Yeah. You've got your own uh, WordPress site, Kill Monday Games. I'm looking at it right now. There's a nice mm. postmortem about it. People can read about it if they're curious. Yeah. Uh, and they can find the game on Steam and, and mobile soon enough. Uh, yes. That's what I'm hoping for. And as for me, I'm at Tron Knots on Twitter. You can watch the show later on youtube.com slash Show, or you can listen to it on Libsyn and iTunes. Uh, tell your friends, let them know uh, that this episode is like one of the best and they all have to listen to it to understand <laughs> what a, a woman from Chile moved to Sweden, created a game that like healed her soul. How much more uh, good does it get than that? That's like the best story ever. Thank you so much for being on the show. It sounds like a legend almost. You are a legend. <laughs> You did. They could make a game about your life, and it would be well. You kind of did. Mr. Red. <laughs> okay. Go to bed, Mr. Red. Okay. <laughs>